This show is brought to you by IndieWrestling.us. Check out IWC, RWA, and more. Click the Fight TV link on WrestlingMayhemShow.com to support this show and watch pro wrestling, MMA, boxing, and so much more. And listeners like you, support this show at Patreon.com slash WrestlingMayhemShow. Hey guys, it's the Indie Mayhem Show, live from the Beachview Studios, Sorgatron Media Studios in Pittsburgh, PA. Uh, and uh, we got a great one here this week. But first, please check out everything Indie Wrestling, Indie Mayhem Show uh, at WrestlingMayhemShow.com. Subscribe to Indie Mayhem Show on the iTunes, Stitcher, Spreaker, iHeartRadio, and the video versions on the Wrestling Mayhem Show Facebook and YouTube page. Drop us a line at Good Times at WrestlingMayhemShow.com or the hotline at 412 206 WMS0. Hit us with any comments, questions, people you think we should talk to, anything else regarding Indie Wrestling, anything that we're missing as far as Indie Wrestling that's out there for us to talk about. And also, uh, drop a line over in the Wrestling Mayhem Show Facebook group. A lot of great discussion about all kinds of pro wrestling. So we, uh, I think it's the first time we've had somebody on uh, twice in one year that didn't involve alcohol. Uh, <laughs> yet, I think. Uh, so uh, we, we talked to this fellow back in Meadville as part of the uh, of the Mega Plowers tag team. And he's joining us here in the studio, Magnum CK. Who dis? Hi. What's up? What's up, man? Listen, I'll tell you this right now. I'm trying my best to contain myself. I'm going to do the best that I can, but I don't want to disappoint anybody at the same time. Because here's my goal. All right, so I noticed on the page you put, we'd be talking from 8 to 9. <laughs> and I also noticed that we're on Broadway. That's right. And that's also a Broadway, 60 Minutes. But the deal is this, we'll be done when I say I'm done. We ain't going down till the sun comes up. It's going to be the longest record episode in the history of this show. I'm a, I go way back with the show. I've been, how long have you been on the air now? Uh, we've been doing, well, we, well, with, the, with this show, we've been doing for about almost four years. Yeah, I've been a fan five, six years of this show. It's been a long time. <laughs> I, watch it, I watch it all the time. But no, listen, here's the thing. I have two, I have two real goals here today. Is one is I want to leave here. Uh, thinking that, man, I can't wait to come back, and I want you thinking, I hope that guy never comes back. <laughs> <laughs> you have no idea how many of those we have on the list. Uh <laughs> hey, it sounds good to me, man. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm enjoying watching these people walking by. It's a beautiful studio, but uh, outside, uh, you know, every rose has its thorn. <laughs> well, there you go. There you go. It, it takes all kinds, right? Well, okay, first of all, the standard icebreaker here. Yeah. Uh, uh, what is your earliest memory of pro, pro wrestling? Oh, um, uh, SummerSlam 89. I was, I was, uh, I don't even know how old I was, but it was in a WWF magazine. I remember the picture. It was, uh, it was Hulk Hogan hitting Zeus in the face with Sherry's purse. And I remember at the time I couldn't read yet. Uh, I mean, I could read here and there, but I couldn't read like, you know, the high, the high, uh, uh, highbrow articles in WWF magazine. Uh, so I didn't know what he was hitting Zeus with, but it looked like an iron. So I thought, oh my God, he hit that guy in the face with an iron. And then, uh, you know, a few years later I got the tape and I found that it was the loaded purse. But so I've really based most of my life around Zeus and Hogan. Okay. <laughs> 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 and again, I don't know if you guys can catch on video or if you're on the audio. Like he is sporting the fanny pack. Oh, he is full on. Listen, yeah, Look at that's this. that's the Savage Stash. The Savage Stash. That's my official. They're my official sponsor for fanny packs. There you go. And the deal is, you know, someone said the other day. They said, "Oh man, you know, I saw you at uh, whatever show it was. You know, I really love your gimmick." And I was like, "What gimmick?" This is, this is what I do, man. I walk around. Listen, listen, I'm, I'm a married man with a wife. And you think that first week with the fanny pack was easy? <laughs> well, and that's the truth. You walked in here and it look, I, I made the comment before we started recording. You look like you walk straight off of your Facebook profile because I yeah. follow your personal profile. Sure. And this is you 24 seven from the looks of things. I mean, for the most part, yeah. you know, I try, I try, I won't always rock a bandana or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But when I'm feeling, when I'm feeling it, you know, that's, that's when I rock that. But yeah, mostly, you know, you know, the the fanny pack started as a deal like oh man old old wrestlers used to wear fanny packs that that should probably still wear that now i'm like this is great 
<laughs> that's fantastic. <laughs> all my pockets are empty. I can just have all my items. You're, you're <laughs> losing so much less stuff at, at, at the shows, right? I mean, it's functional. You know, I had an idea on my way over here because, you know, a lot of us wrestlers, we get something that we get something that Rick Rude used to call the sickness, right? You know, it's where you get you get the sickness. You can't stop thinking about wrestling. You wrestle, you know, until you're until you're until you're dead, unfortunately. But, you know, I had an idea, speaking of that, on the way over that I could just put items in my fanny pack. Now, bear with me. I put items in my fanny pack and then if you come up to my table and uh you at a show and let's say i'm not even gonna say you have to buy anything you probably should i mean that's the right thing to do but that's between you and god but if you do something to entertain me or you're funny or you have a cool shirt you can have a secret mystery item out of my fanny pack you cannot reach into my fanny pack <laughs> <laughs> because there are things who knows what could be lurking in that fanny pack but I'm, i thought about that i thought it might be something i try uh that there's a little tiny little tiny super duper crazy awesome important show happening tomorrow that i'm sure mm -hmm. we'll talk about maybe mm -hmm. i'll try it a little bit there we'll see what goes on absolutely I, 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 we're gonna have to do a follow-up to see how that how that goes maybe during our Facebook lives that we do an intermission or well, something. Well, I'll be back on Monday, right? Am yeah. I coming back? <laughs> <laughs> this is a nice couch. I can sleep on this. I <laughs> actually, our 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 uh, somebody was actually taking a nap on there earlier today <laughs> when they were stopping in. We were doing some interviews, and 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 my one producer, and he's just like, no, I'm just gonna chill here it's for a, a comfy bit. couch listen yeah, i'm yeah. deep in it i feel relaxed <laughs> i feel like i'm sinking down into this exactly. couch but in a good way you know what they don't tell you when you do this show is that you can see yourself on the screen so i feel like yeah that's a better shirt angle <laughs> there you go you can adjust <laughs> um so so <laughs> moving on uh and i know you got a really interesting story about you know uh coming up in, in, in pro wrestling too uh we talked about it a little bit in meadville you know, um, can you talk a little bit about kind of your path from from, you know, being a fan, seeing, you know, determining it was finally a purse with Sensational Sherry. And, yeah. and, and and how did you get from there to, you know, deciding you want to get into the ring? Well, really, once I got my hands on the tape, uh, I, I never stopped. Uh, I, once I saw Mr. T wrestle at WrestleMania 1, I was inspired. No, Mr. T was terrible. Um, no, you know, my uncle was a, re was a wrestler and is mm -hmm. currently, he, he still promotes some shows. So I've been around it my whole life and I think I've talked about it on lots of different things, but, uh, Wahoo McDaniel and Ivan Koloff were the first main event I ever saw. And, and, and actually the guy who came with me here, mean Mike, dirty Mike, American dream, Mike Rhodes, baby, uh, standing over there. We were actually at that show together and didn't even know each other at the time. It was in St. Mary's, West Virginia. And uh, Lord Zoltan was there for all, for all you mm -hmm. Pittsburghers, uh, who I just wrestled for the first time a few months ago at one of my uncle's shows. So it was just <laughs> like, I guess I should retire tonight? Like, <laughs> like unless Wahoo comes back, like, I don't know what else I can do to make this full circle. So... Uh, uh yeah so i then you know i went from there I, I met the good guys and i met the bad guys and mm -hmm. and i got to be friends with a lot of the guys and then uh uh then when i got a little older i got to take the jackets back you know when the guys would come out and i remember distinctly one time being in like somewhere in the middle of west virginia or ohio or something and uh it was my job to take the jackets back. My uncle probably has it on tape, but one of the guys took his leather jacket because it was it was his personal leather jacket. So he hung it over the ring post and I couldn't reach it. <laughs> Just me on tape, like standing there, like, what do I do? Because I'm wearing a Charles Barkley jersey of all things. <laughs> taking the ring jackets back so yeah i just uh i grew up in the business and i just kind of never left you know in in 04 through about 08 i was wrestling and uh uh i took some time off for some different things i did some some acting you know i lived in chicago i studied at second city did some other things but i still never left i was still doing commentary on shows i was still helping write shows you know and and helping uh uh you know, run shows. I mean, it's the weirdest thing. Like, you know, I, when I wasn't in those years where I wasn't really wrestling very much, I remember handing Matt Hardy, like pay envelopes, you know, <laughs> like helping run shows like this is weird. <laughs> like kind of be in office, you know? Mm -hmm. And so then about a year and a half, I came back, you know, because, uh, well, see, I'm 31 now. And I thought, well, you know, I, I, I could make, make a little hay while the sun's shining here. And I'll tell you the good thing about it is, uh, is no matter what anybody tells you, uh, uh, it seems like they're not really doing things for themselves. And I can honestly say that this wrestling run that I'm on right now is 100% for myself. Um, I actually have, I, I listen, I will take, if, if the, if the world wrestling entertainment federation, whatever they call, whatever they're called these days, if the WWE said, Hey, listen, you know, 
we'd want love to take a look at you. Who, everybody on the planet Earth would do it. Right. But that is not anywhere within the realms of any of the goals that I have. You know, if that's something that ever happened, sure. But I'll tell you, my goal is I love independent wrestling. I love doing my own thing. I love creating my own thing. I love being able to sit backstage with someone and build something together and not have someone come up and be like, yeah, how about three minutes roll up? You know, <laughs> so so uh, the art of it is what I love. And I've really grown to love uh not that I didn't before, but I've really grown close to a lot of the wrestling fans and I've become friends with a lot of the fans. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, we play a lot of characters and stuff like that. But when you finally realize that all you have to do is just be some certain version of yourself and be a real person, but just be an interesting version of yourself, that's when it's, you know, jetpack on you all the way to the moon. And that's what I feel like I'm hitting that stride right now, as a matter of fact. I haven't seen that transition and I want to talk a little bit more about that, but I'm kind of curious. So what, you know... What were you trying before in pro wrestling that you know it wasn't working for you? You know, because it, it sounds like there might have been a little bit of experimentation. Yeah, well, there was a lot of frustration because I can tell you what I was doing is I was trying to make it, and that's a terrible right. that's a terrible way to go about it because then you're not doing anything for yourself and you're doing everything because you think it might be what someone else likes to do. You know, uh, so and it also leads to a lot of banging your head against the wall. So mm-hmm. I started in I started in 2004. And, and it's kind of an interesting story how I started training. And since we have several hours ahead of us, I'll yeah, go it's ahead all it's all booked story. up on Facebook. We're good. We're good. I cleared my schedule for the night. Don't worry about it. What time's IWC start? We, we have tomorrow? until bell time tomorrow. Yeah, uh, I don't have to, to be there till like four thirty. So we got all kinds of time. <laughs> but uh, you know, so uh, I showed up at one of my local uh, wrestling federations, which is run by a fellow who I'm not a big fan of. Uh, for different reasons, but even at the time, but I was just trying to break in. I had some friends who were kind of in, mm-hmm. and uh, so I went in and I and I just hopped in the ring. You know, they, I helped set up the ring for a few months, and then I just hopped in the ring one time, and I was kind of rolling around, and you, you know, and then he came up and he's like, "Oh, hey, uh, you know, it's gonna be." It's going to be uh, f- uh, 50 bucks and we'll give you a tryout and I'll see how much your training will cost. And I was like, I'm, I'm 18. I just turned 18. I had no money and I sure wasn't going to give this shyster any money. <laughs> so mm-hmm. uh, I had an idea. So what I came up with was because they were only training one time a month. They ran one show a month and they were training at, 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 this, at the place where they ran the show. Well, my parents had this old church building. It was like this church building built in the late 1800s. It was crazy. It had like this stone foundation, all that jazz. It was like it, this building can't be moved it's a it's an official landmark you know so it can't be torn down but you can use it for storage you can do whatever you want with it otherwise so i said hey you know i have this building what if between shows through the month you set up your ring you bring out your guys you charge whoever you want whatever you want to train but just let me train and i think for an 18 year old kid that's pretty ambitious and it ended up working out and i got hundreds and hundreds of hours of training in, you know and, and practice matches and whatnot and i learned from a lot of different guys and uh, before long, I was wrestling on shows, and I started out like everybody starts out for the most part, unless you know, unless you're a, uh, one of these guys who starts out as a major second generation guy. Because I would consider myself, I guess, a second generation guy. So I kind of picked up on it pretty quickly. But uh, uh, I started out in Battle Royals, and so I, there was a show booked in Glenville, West Virginia. That's where Mike, Mike, you went to college in Glenville, Glenville, uh, Glenville State. Is that what it's called? They got a blue McDonald's in Glenville. A blue. It's blue. It's unbelievable. Uh, <laughs> you'll be, is, that you'll, the, is that the claim to fame down there? Is that what's up? That's what it said. You drive into town, says population 78. We got blue McDonald's. <laughs> hey, you got to have something. Right? There's the place with the giant tea, the giant tea uh, uh, thing. And, and, uh, yeah. Uh, what, what is that? Up in the Vir- top of West Virginia. Right? Oh, right, right, yeah, right, right. Near, near New, well, so this is like wherever in like kind of central West Virginia. I don't remember yeah. where it is, but uh, Dusty Rhodes was on the card. Jeff Jarrett's on the card. Abyss, a few other guys. And I'm like, oh, man, mm-hmm. they drew about a couple thousand because they're students you know so they it was like free to the students but the college paid for it whatever i don't know but anyway so dusty Rhodes is there and i'm thinking oh my gosh i'm gonna meet dusty Rhodes and jeff jarrett and abyss it's gonna be great and i'll do my battle royal and i'll come back and just try to talk to dusty and i get there and they're like oh you have a match kid i'm like what <laughs> my first match ever and guess who's standing behind the curtain for every match is dusty Rhodes. and i've told the story a bunch but um so I was just crapping my pants, man, because Dusty Rhodes is, is is I mean, it, we could all talk about greatest ever. I mean, my, my greatest ever changes every day, but Dusty Rhodes is in that conversation. So uh, he's watching all the matches, and I went out, and for a first match, and I'll tell you, for a first match, it wasn't bad. It was okay. It was a tag match. There was one veteran in the tag match, and he was a little frustrated, but, the, you know, everybody else sucked, but I was the only one who had their first match, so I was the only one who had an excuse. But... <laughs> So I come back to the back and I'm kind of like, oh man, I didn't know what to think. You know, I didn't 
know how it felt or whatever. And I just went up to Dusty and I was like, uh, you know, hello, uh, Mr. Rhodes. And he's like, oh, call me Virgil. Because he, because Dusty, the thing about Dusty is he has, you know, he talked like that, you know, the TV talks, Dusty Rhodes, there, all that. But when he talked in real life, he had just a little bit of that. You know, he had a little tiny, it was like really dialed back. And he's like, oh, call me Virgil. And I said, uh, I'm sorry, but can I call you? can I call you dusty? And he was like, that's fine, kid. And I said, you know, I wondered if you had any advice for me, uh, or how it went, you know, uh, please. And he said, uh, how many methods you had? And I said, well, tonight was my first one, sir. And he said, you learning, you learning. And that was it. And I, you know, cause I mean, listen, that wasn't a good thing he could say <laughs> <laughs> about the match. But so that was my one real he, run in. With he didn't Dusty. tell you to go home and never come back. Well, right. You yeah, know, that's yeah. The, yeah, that's a funny thing. I, you know, and I just told Mike a story from the other day. You know, the uh, AIW had Arn Anderson down for a seminar. And there was mm-hmm. a guy uh, uh, who goes to a training school. I don't care who's watching this. Uh, not, not my good friends at AIW. I mean, I mean, the person this has to happen to because it happened. I know what happened because he told me the story. But uh, he's, he's in his 40s and he just started out in wrestling. And, uh, you know, he trains like once a month and it's a hobby and that's fine. But uh, he'll, he might not ever have a first match. I don't know. But anyway, he went up to Arn Anderson and said, hey, uh, Mr. Anderson, do you have any advice for a, for a, a 42-year-old uh, getting ready to have, you know, to try to start in pro wrestling? And Arn just goes, no. <laughs> <laughs> so it could have been a worse interaction. Yeah. But God bless Arn yeah. for being honest because, you know, what are you going to do? But <clears throat> there's, not, there's not a lot of that happening unless you're like a, a football player. Right. No. Right. Exactly. <laughs> but I'll tell you this and I'll give this advice to anybody out there because uh, uh, I, I think it's important. So so I spent about four years kind of frustratingly not knowing what to do and doing what I thought other guys would do and mm-hmm. seeing guys. It, it was a really hot time in the Indies, you know, Samoa Joe and CM Punk and all these guys. I'm like, oh, I got to do that kind of stuff. And I'm like, well, that wasn't really working for me. And I'm like, oh, I got to do this other. So I couldn't figure it out. Mm-hmm. So. uh I stepped away from it and I, and I learned a lot more about theater. I worked in some professional theater environments as well. And I just really, really threw myself into some other things. And then I learned more about wrestling in those seven or eight years I took off from from wrestling than I ever did when I was in it the first time. So when I came back, I I remember getting in the ring uh, about a year and a half ago. And then, uh, cause I had trained up with Mike Quackenbush and Chikara a little bit and, uh, to get ready. Uh, and when I got in the ring, uh, I was like, Oh, it's theater. I get it now. Oh my gosh, it's theater. And then it just felt like, like, oh, it took all the, it took 29 years. Well, actually it was on my 30th birthday when I came back. So it took 30 years to finally get it. And then I was like, bang, I got it. And ever since then, I've just had the, had the confidence to, to feel like I can do what I want to do. If that makes any sense. Mm-hmm. That's great. And, and I know well, when I first caught one of you, of course, as far as the mega plowers with Jock Sampson who's something we've, he was on, I think episode three of the show. Yeah. Uh, and this is like where we're in like with one eighties or something. Uh, so <laughs> shows you how long that was. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, talk a little bit about that. Cause that was, uh, one, I, I, you know, we started seeing your promos here at IWC in the Pittsburgh area and it looked like you guys were just like having fun with it. Well, that's exactly it, you know, so uh, I just made a joke because I I had known Jock on the periphery for a while because as I was kind of on my way out the first time around, he was kind of coming in and Mm -hmm. he tried some different things. I think he did like a, well, that's where the name Jock kind of came from, I think, like a sports gimmick type thing, you Mm -hmm. know. Get a headband Uh, and all this stuff. Right, well, which is him in a way. I mean, you know, he's he's all football, he's football, you know, and Mm -hmm. then when football season's over, he'll get into other sports. He's a big sports, sports, sports guy. Although we were up in Canada Jock, if you remember this, you're trying to tell all the Canadians that none of, none of the Americans down here liked hockey. And I was like, um, uh, <laughs> hold on, sir. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, so I kind of knew him on the periphery, and I, would, I helped him with a couple of videos he did and stuff like that. And then, and then uh, we made this Mike, – Mike and I made this documentary called Marking Out. It's actually on uh, – Which I have seen. Yeah, it's I on – I have seen. It was – it was it, yeah. It came ac- it came across Amazon Prime. I found yeah. it, and I'm watching this thing, and then I'm like, I'm, I'm watching it. And I'm like, I'm seeing like people I know. Like yeah. I think Fasad is in it. I heard yeah. Joe Dombrowski on commentary, and I even yeah. had to hit him up. I was like, you know, you're in this documentary. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, that, and a skinny fat version of me is in that as well. Mm-hmm. You know, it's funny if you watch that because as we were making the documentaries, when I decided, like, man, I love this wrestling thing. I've been denying it for a while, and I had some, you know, listen, I've had my fa- my fair share of personal problems too, and and, mm-hmm. and things like that but uh you know so i kind of went on a journey throughout making that with mike and uh 
And you can watch the movie. If you watch in the beginning, like I'll slowly, like I'm getting like inflated. Like I'm like getting bigger as the movie goes on. <laughs> Cause I'm preparing to come back to wrestling. Uh, Cause it just kind of happened. Uh, but anyway, I just made an offhanded joke one time. I was like, you know, uh, on another podcast that Mike and I used to do. And, uh, I said, you know, I'm going to team up with Jock Sampson. We're going to dress up as farmers. And we're going to call ourselves the Mega Plowers. <laughs> <laughs> Which, in hindsight, is a much better idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, it's, it sticks out a little bit, and yeah. you're way over in some of those fringe towns. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You're like I can uh, relate to that. <laughs> we we'd be really we'd be really over in the rust belt. Exactly. Uh, but uh, but you know so then the idea just I I, I kind of pitched the jock and you know it was a double edged thing. It was one. It was a new thing. I'd never really done much of a tag team thing. I mean I had here and there, but never mm-hmm. really committed to one. And uh, you know and then the idea kind of we developed it a little bit into kind of this 80s kind of NWA type thing. Uh, the wrestling one, not the rap group. <laughs> <laughs> just to be clear. <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, and then it kind of became what it, you know, what it became. And also it was a good way for me to kind of get back into things a little bit. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, my first match, a couple of matches back were singles matches for sure. But, the, but adjusting to a tag team style was good. And now I'm, you know, I'm having a lot more fun, uh, uh, you know, as well. I dipped my toe in. Now I'm kind of all the way in, you know, mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm a singles champion in a lot of places and that's been great. Cause I've been getting some longer singles matches and stuff. And, and it really allowed me to explore some new things and, and kind of bring out the character that I want to bring out, which again is just what I think a pro, what I, what I would like. I thought of what would I like to see? Like if I was a pro wrestling fan right now, like who would I want to go watch? And that's what I'm trying to be. And and whether you like it or not, because I'm not one of those old school versus new school guys. I mean, wrestling's a fluid art form. It's an art form and it's fluid. You know, there's different kinds of theater. You know, mm-hmm. especially living in Chicago, there's all kinds of different kinds. And 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 so there's something for everybody. And I think wrestling's cool because if you go to like a weird kind of like black box theater and see some weird show somebody you know in South, South Chicago wrote, you know, or whatever, you might be like, yeah, this is weird. Or you could go see Wicked up, you know. Uh, up in the loop but uh wrestling's cool because the first match could be some kind of like crazy off the wall deal and then the second match could be jock samson and zoltan you know what i mean like i mean you know so and we're talking we're talking arm bars and and pajama pants right so i think a wrestling show has room to be the baskin robbins you know it can Mm -hmm. be all these different flavors and sometimes the flavors get mixed together and that's interesting too i've always said for a long time i've wanted to see jock samson versus facade because what the hell would that be (laughs) like i don't know what would happen like first of all first of all i want to watch them talk it out like Mm -hmm. and figure it out because i'd be like oh this is what we should be taping like what are we taping the match for tape this (laughs) (laughs) so uh you know so i i feel that way you know and And like just I was in Cleveland, you know, you you spoke about Joe Dombrowski. Um, That was kind of a turning point for me. That was a bit of a coming out part of me, coming out party for me because I had some time off. I did I did uh, some some a professional theater show. And uh, so I had a few weeks off and then I just kind of hit full stride with this kind of newish uh, new slant on on the character I've been doing, which is kind of what I've been wanting to do. And I found and uh, you know what we did, you know, we did some crazy stuff. I think I choke slammed Chris LaRusso on the apron, you know, and stuff <laughs> like that. But I also did like a Roddy Piper eye poke and like a dusty elbow, you know, so like, mm-hmm. I think I, I this whole if you remember a few months back, that whole headlock versus dive type thing. You know, with that, whatever that was on Twitter and all that. I mean, I just don't, buy, I, you know what, you could, I'll do a diving headlock. How about that? You know, like, you know, there's room for everybody and there's room for everything. And I'll wrestle Matt Seidel tomorrow and I'll wrestle Hacksaw Jim Duggan on Sunday. You know, yeah. I mean, I'll get, throw it all at me. You know, I think that's important. Absolutely. I, I want to touch a little bit more on the theater. I've been watching your Facebook and seeing a lot about the productions and everything. And I, I think it's important to kind of see how varied of things. Like, I think, wasn't there a picture of you as uh, uh, Frank Furter from, from yeah. Rocky picture, Rocky Horror Picture Show? Yeah, man, I lost like a bunch of weight for that. So yeah. I, I, I'm right now I'm sitting pretty at about, and this is, listen, if you hear a ring announcer say a different number, you believe him over what I'm about to tell you. Because I'm sitting pretty about 260 right now. But if a ring announcer tells you 281, you know, that's, 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 he, he knows better than I do, but, um, yeah, the, the so, weight, the weight is different in the squared circle. Well, right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. The gravity. So I stronger. lost at the time when I got that role was in 2011. So I've been out of, out of active wrestling competition for a couple of years. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I shrunk down to 191. Because I thought, well, Frankenfurter, you know, he's got to, and I was younger, a little younger at the time. So I thought, man, he's got to be this skinny, like rock star looking guy. So I just like 
cut all my calories in half. I cut weights. I, I did push ups and pull ups and cardio for like six months or more and just dropped weight, you know? Um, and that's actually where I met my wife, uh, doing that show. She played Janet and I was Frankenfurter, but I'd never done a musical before in my life. And I'd never been encouraged to do one. I, I you know, I, I didn't exactly grow up in the most encouraging. I, I mean, I kind of fell through the cracks a little bit growing up. So I didn't know I could, I didn't know I could do anything. And that's not just the saying like, Ooh, I'm great type thing. That's for everybody because you really can. Uh, but I didn't know, I didn't have that mentality of, Oh man, you can do it. If you just figure out how to do it and you crack the code for yourself, you can do anything. And I thought, well, I really like Rocky horror. I was like the movie. And I was like, man, I can't do that though. That's a bummer. You know? And I remember, uh, my, uh, wife, my wife at the time. Yeah. If you keep them count, there's a couple of them, but this is the last one <laughs> that I have now, thankfully. Uh, uh, and very happily, but, uh, but you know, she, my wife at the time, had bought, she bought me a ticket to see young Frankenstein, the musical. I don't know if you're familiar with Mel Brooks type stuff, but I sat in the audience and I was heartbroken because it was my, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And it was, it was the movie just on stage with music. And I'm like, man, I'll never get to do that. Like, that's such a bummer. And then, you know, a year later, I ended up doing Rocky Horror, and then a couple of years later, I was doing Young Frankenstein. And I was playing the dream role. I was playing. I was playing Frederick. Uh, you know the um, Gene Wilder role. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you can just say it, it took a lot of hard work. You know, it took a lot, a lot of determination, and I and I really genuinely wanted it, which I also, which I also think is important. Uh, if you if there's something you want to do out there, you can do it, but you have to bust your booty to get there, and uh, and and it was scary. I'll say of all the things I've ever done, I mean. You know, I'm a, according to the ring announcers, I'm a 280 pound man. And I just, I just jumped last Saturday. I jumped uh, macho man elbowed off the top rope. And I will say this every time, every time I, I, I have that moment right before I'm climbing up being like, what are you doing? <laughs> like you are too big to be doing this. I say, yeah, you're, you're, you're kind of more wrestler size. I guess we can say yeah. not like that indie size that we, we like, you know, not the right you know, uh, uh, for the against, indies. I'm kind of monstrous yeah, in a lot yeah. of places. I mean, there was an interesting thing. I a, a realization I had years ago watching IWC going to the shows and, and, you know, walking up to Ray Rowe and realize like I'm taller than Ray Rowe and yeah. he's the biggest guy there. And yeah. I walked through the roster, you know, I was around for the meeting uh, last month at IWC and realizing like, wow, I'm actually not the yeah. biggest guy here. And I'm 6'4". Right. right. And that's what you think of is like the Rock, John Cena size, Hulk mm -hmm. Hogan, 6'4", 6'5", is like average for WWE. And that's yeah. what you think of wrestler size. And exactly. Well, you know, and, and so, so I remember the first time I ever, because, and I, listen, I, I have I probably have ADHD. I say probably, which means it's on my official diagnosis. So I do have ADHD. So I'll get sidetracked. But I'll tell you this also. Um, in two thousand and six ish or so, I wrestled a fellow named Chris Kronos, who used to be up around Cleveland and stuff like that when okay. we used to do Cleveland All Pro and stuff. And for the first time ever, I tried an elbow off the top rope, and I chickened out, and I landed on my feet and i i was so embarrassed i didn't even think about it so i hadn't tried one until a couple of months ago i was just like i'm gonna do it because i love the macho man you mm -hmm. know right now i'm in a he's the greatest ever phase right now so uh so i went up to the top and i thought listen randy did it about ten thousand times i can try it once and i just nailed it and it felt great uh of the guy moved, <laughs> but, but that, you know, so every time I've ever climbed up to the top rope since then, which has been several times since then, I've thought of somebody I've thought about, you know, I think about, you know, some of my ancestors who passed away, you know, or I thought about, you know, I was missing my wife last week. I, I didn't get to see her. So I thought like, you know, I know you're somewhere, you're going to feel this elbow, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. So, so I think that's important too. If you can, if you can find the mental state and that goes all the way full circle back to the musical thing, I was like, okay, well people do this somebody can do this right and 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 if you'll indulge me for one second what this goes back to is i had a teacher and I, i'm going to spread this message till the day i die and if that's the day well then i held my promise uh his name was mr dennis and he was my he was my psychology teacher in high school my history teacher in high school and we in my senior year i had never told anybody that i wanted to be a pro wrestler but it's all i ever wanted to be my entire life you know since i was a kid it's all i ever knew really uh i used to sit in my room and write wrestling programs and storylines and record you know commentary tracks and all this i mean that's all i did and uh and I wrote a paper because we had to write our last assignment for the year was write what do you want to do when you leave high school. And I, I, I finally got up the courage and I wrote this whole essay about how I wanted to be a pro wrestler. And I cut out a picture of uh, from a magazine at the time had Ric Flair and uh, and I pasted that in and, and I turned it in and immediately was like, 
like you ever see office space where he where uh where uh uh peter slides the documents under the door to admit that they stole the money and then he immediately is like trying to get it i had that feeling i turned it in and i wanted to be like give it back like no like i'll take it up uh, i was so embarrassed and and then i was so nervous to get the paper back and when i got it back at the on the very last page uh i had an a and it said it said chris somebody has to be a pro wrestler why not you and since that day, I was like, oh, my God, it took me a few years to really fully live by that. But I never forgot it. And I've passed that on to every show I've ever directed, every actor I've ever directed, every student I've ever helped, uh, every, everyone I've ever whoever listened, I would say that. So it is possible. And, and, you know, if you're some if you're a 42 year old guy and you're trying to get in wrestling, you're probably not going to be in the main event, but you can be involved in wrestling somehow and you can do you can live some part of your dream. Uh, because, uh, and I think that I thought that with musicals and I thought that when I do elbow drops, <laughs> somebody else did this, millions of other people did this. So you can do it too. That's great. Yeah. That's great. That is great. <laughs> <laughs> what, what can, do I call you? What should I call you? Michael? Do I call you uh, Sorg? Sorg's fine. What, I'm you, here. And then your fans are called the Sorg and donors. No, no, no. <laughs> 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 Nobody's asked me that before. The, the, the what? The all you organ donors out there, dude. <laughs> <laughs> the five demandments of sorgamania, <laughs> which is have a comfy couch, <laughs> have a beer store down the street, <laughs> <laughs> have a studio next to a train. Well, watch what this crazy asshole is doing in our in our driveway right now. <laughs> hey, I parked I parked a ways down the road. I figured I figured that we'd draw some flies. Yeah, maybe a little bit. Maybe a little bit. I think they're showing up right now. So <laughs> but uh anyways, where'd I go from that? There's a lot of distractions happening right now. Yeah, that's my life. I live my life you know, some people live their life a quarter mile at a time. I live my life one distraction at a time. Yep, yep. Um okay, from that. Uh so so you've kind of rebooted yourself now. Um, kind of where are you going from here? You know what? Uh, kind of, kind of just wherever it ends up. Uh, mm-hmm. I'll say I'm one of those guys that I had to learn to, uh, to, to push myself, uh, not only just personally, but to push myself on the people and, and not in a rapey way, but like in like a, <laughs> which is also weird that I thought that, but this, it's all right. Uh, uh, but no, what I mean by that is I used, I was the type of person that like, I felt I felt that I couldn't take up space in this world. You know what I mean? So like, I remember, uh, uh, when I was out of high school, I had a part-time job and I was working banquets at, at this uh, really nice hotel in my hometown. And, uh, I was always walked through back to the kitchen, you know, and I'd be like, Oh, you know, excuse me. Oh, sorry. 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 Apologizing to everybody. And I was finally this dishwasher and he's like a 50 year old guy and he'd been there dishwashing forever. And he literally stopped me and he, he turned me around and he said, listen, you're allowed to take up space in this world. You don't have to apologize for, for existing. And that kind of started that train of thought of like, wow, okay. And then uh, I've gotten to the point where, you know what, a lot of these bookings I've gotten, and I have a lot of big ones coming up that I haven't really talked publicly about because some of them are kind of little surprise things, are because I said, listen, hello, I'm so-and-so, you know, this person and this person, this person knows me. Uh, ask them, you know, they can maybe vouch for me or maybe they secretly don't like me. <laughs> I don't know. We'll find out. But, you know, here's what I think I can offer to your show. And and here's this and that. And it's not about a dollar figure necessarily. Uh, mm-hmm. It's just about trying new things and getting to new places. And that's served me very well in the last year and a half because, uh, you know, when I think about uh, it was about two years ago that I really started thinking about, man, you know, maybe I could do this thing. And it was Thanksgiving two years ago. I was wearing a sting shirt of all things. And I messaged Adam Johnson from remix pro wrestling. And I said, what do you think about me wrestling again? And he said, anytime. Uh, but that's because I had a friendship with him because we worked together and, mm-hmm. and that's being a nice guy will get you a long way, uh, or gal, you know, uh, but I just feel that, you know, not being afraid to push yourself, not in an annoying way, not in a pretentious way of, or overconfident way, but just being like, you know what, here's what I think I can offer you. And here's what, why I'm different, you know, or, or here's how I can help you, mm-hmm. you know, and please contact me if you've ever liked to, uh, you know, do something. And then sometimes months goes by and I just got, you know, a couple of months ago, I was taking my two stepdaughters to get their hair dyed and uh, I got a message from a, from a a promoter for a, for a place I've always wanted to work for. And that's going to be happening very soon. And that was three or four months after I just sent him a random message, you know? So I, I think that's part of it. And I think as many, I was thinking of myself kind of like Johnny Appleseed type thing. Like I'm going to all these, all these re- different wrestling federations and they might not know me, 
when I get there, but they'll pro- hopefully remember me when I leave. And that's not just the fans, that's the promoters and the wrestlers, because I've never had a fan get me a booking. And, and I always respect the fans, and they're the reason why there's a show happening. But no fans ever got me a booking, but I can tell you that uh, boys in the back have. You know, so if you just treat the boys well or the girls or whoever, I say boys, that doesn't mean it's not a sex thing. It's just the, uh, you know, it's not a gender thing. It's just uh, the, the talent. You know, you treat the talent well, and they'll do, do favors for you right back. Awesome. Awesome. That we, is awesome. We... <laughs> <laughs> I get rambling, man. I'm sorry. No, this is great. Um, I, we, we talked about it a little bit, but I want to I want to roll back a little bit and talk about the documentary you guys did. Um, 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 you know, th- how how did that come about? Well, it's funny, actually. Um, uh, I, I lived in Chicago for a while. And uh, right before I moved away, somebody had a, a, a small film that they wanted to do like a short film, like a one day shoot or something like that. And I went and did that. And, uh, this guy named Mike Rhodes was working on it. I think you were doing sound. Is that right? Yeah. He was editing and doing sound on it. And, uh, so, you know, I think we became Facebook friends and stuff, you know, and, and I, I think I had to, I went back to his house to kind of, you know, re-record some stuff or add some stuff or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And again, like, okay, yeah, that's what it was. Cause some of the audio didn't work out, which I knew as I was sitting a, a, on the set, I was like, we're going to redo this audio because <laughs> magically I have the, I also have that talent of like, this ain't going to work guys. <laughs> you know? No, been on plenty of those. Yeah. 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 Yep, and it's yep. like, you're the jerk who was naysaying everything. And then three months later, they're like, can you come back and do it again? Yeah. <laughs> like, I told you it wasn't going to work. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, so, you know, I think a lot of people, maybe not a lot of people, but I think some people would have been annoyed by that or been a jerk, but I was excited. I was like, Oh, cool. I get another chance. I can maybe try to do better this time. And, and, mm-hmm. you know, and then so I, I went to Mike's house, you know, and, and recorded that stuff. And then, uh, not, not too long after that, I moved away. But, uh, when he found out I was moving back, he's like, Hey, I'm glad you're moving back because I have this idea kicking around in my head for this like short film, short, like fake documentary, like a mockumentary type thing based off of loosely based, inspired by Brody Stevens. Right. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. In his whole his real life thing. But anyway, uh, and it's loosely based on wrestling as well. So we kind of we did that together. And then uh, uh, so that's and then we just kind of became friends, obviously, after that. And then we started a little podcast together. We did that, you know, type of thing. And then now we message each other every day. (laughs) (laughs) But what happened was, you know, so we work with Remix Pro Wrestling a lot because it's, mm-hmm. it's close. At the time, I was living in that town. And, uh, we, you know, we're kicking around some ideas about possibly doing a documentary about that. And it went from being like a short film about Remix Pro Wrestling to being like, you know, Stan Hansen's going to be in West Virginia and we should go to New York. And have you heard of Chikara? You know, like and then it just became this whole big, long thing that we started and had no idea where it was going to go mm-hmm. or how it was going to end up. And it was just a bunch of Mike being like, oh, my God, oh, my God, how am I going to edit this thing? And me being like, it's cool, man. Like, we'll figure it out. And then, like, somehow it all came together to this um, pretty well received. I mean, it's an award winning documentary and I, and I, I still have people ask me about it or for it, you know, and it just came out, you know, what a year and a half ago, you know, we had the premiere, but it was a cool journey and it's a genuine, honest look at just wrestling fandom. Right. And, uh, and it's also, I do a Ric Flair impression to Ric Flair, (laughs) which is a nice little sidebar. But it's also our kind of um, story of me kind of falling back in love with wrestling or just admitting I never fell out of love and Mike kind of accepting, you know, his love for pro wrestling and not hiding it anymore. And, and there's a lot of other stuff in it. Too, right. Mike's the one that had the t-shirt collection, right? Mike that had, you were yeah. like, I can't wear these in public. I remember. And he's yeah. wearing, and then he was like, you stand outside. And I, I don't know where you went. I don't know if you went in the church or what, but I'm just like, that guy's got a Brian Pillman shirt. I yeah. think I should talk to him, but yeah. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. So he went from, uh, you know, afraid to wear this terrible Rusev shirt <laughs> to still being afraid to wear his terrible Rusev shirt. Well, you know. But you will wear a cool Brian Pillman shirt. Shout out to Brian Pillman Jr., who's a friend of mine now. How about that? All right? Yeah, he was up yeah. and he was hanging out in Millville. Yeah, yeah. Or, we, I'm sorry, Meadville. We've been we've been talking uh, on and off ever since. Yeah, good. he's a good guy. Awesome. All right. It is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I might have a transition problem. <laughs> no, hey, that's all right. I mean, listen, we here's what we should we should be talking about too is that there's a lot of cool speaking of Brian Jr. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of cool cool young talent out there. And, uh, and, and I think that we need to keep cultivating that 
And I think that some of these veterans or even veterans need to keep working with these guys mm-hmm. and, and working together, not being like, oh, that's whatever type of wrestling. That's that's like wrestling racism in a weird way. You know, I mean, let's if you don't like what somebody's doing or you think mm-hmm. you can help them, then help them. But just trashing them online is not going to do any good because right. I, speaking of trashing online. So I did this little, I got, I got a, my wife was gone for the weekend. I was bored. So I made a video called Magnum CK does 35 wrestling impressions. And I'm an okay I, impression. I saw that floating around. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I yeah. think I'm okay. And I mean, some are better than others, but you know, uh, that's a, that's a massive undertaking. And I, you know, I shared it on my social media and people were, Oh my God, it's great. You know, good job. And then, uh, the other night, I don't know what happened. I was riding a high of positivity, I suppose. And you ever, you ever heard of Reddit? Uh, squared circle Reddit. I thought, mm-hmm. man, mm-hmm. I think I've been banned from there. <laughs> Someone got banned because of this actually. Uh, so I was like, man, you know, I haven't been on there in forever. I should share that on there because you know I'd shared marking out documentary stuff on there a time or two, and it was very well received. Except mm-hmm. there's always the one guy who's like, yeah, it's okay, I suppose, and it's like, okay, well, the way, <laughs> if it's that unremarkable, then why are you commenting about it? You know. Mm-hmm. So anyway, I thought, hey, I'm gonna share. They're all wrestling fans. I'm gonna share it on here. And within 30 minutes, I deleted it all <laughs> because because here's the thing. And I think it's just human nature. There was tons of positive. Oh, my gosh. The Austin was awesome. And the Roddy Piper was great. And oh, geez. Wow. I haven't heard of that one. Blah, 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 blah. Whatever it was. All, you know, probably 10, 12 comments of that and mm-hmm. a lot of upvotes. And then one guy was just, just one guy just goes, meh. <laughs> I was like, He's so he's so and, unimpressed, and it's always the meh. the the meh always like speaks louder to you, the maker, right? Than w- all the positive. Well, and then that got downvoted a bunch, and the one guy was yeah. like, "Yeah, it just looks like a, a a squinty guy shouting a lot or something like that." And I was like, "Well, first of all, that's what pro wrestling kind of was." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's yeah. not really my fault, but okay, that's fine. And then someone that got downvoted, and then one guy was like. Uh, or a couple of people were like, you know, that's the reason why people can't share stuff on here because mm-hmm. of people like you doing that. And he's like, sorry, just uh, it's pretty unremarkable content. And I was like, I can't do that. I'm not. Listen, I, I have a therapist. I'm doing great. I'm doing much better than I have in other times in my life, but I'm not prepared for this. No, <laughs> like, no, I can't. I can't do that. I can never be a YouTuber. You know, I, the, the clip got a couple of thumbs downs on YouTube and I was just like, wait, wait hold on, hold on, man. Let's talk about it. Like, <laughs> it's like that one thing. Around. I've seen some of the wrestlers doing it. There's the one where people can anonymously like like oh, comment yeah. on you what's that called like sriracha like, or, or sirhehan or i yeah. don't even know and Sira- I'm, just like, I'm like i'm not ready for that i'm just no, no i don't think i can handle because it right for now. every hey i like your butt you're gonna get you're mm-hmm. the absolute worst of all time and kill yourself and quit <laughs> <laughs> you know in that order <laughs> you know and i just i i don't think i mean you you know i, I decided this is a recent development in my life. And, and I'll tell you one thing that, and, and I wouldn't mind getting this message out there. And this, maybe this interview is a little too serious for you for out there in Facebook land. But I'll tell you this, I found therapy. I found that it works for me. I think it worked for everybody. And mm-hmm. I'll say that, you know, happiness is a choice and positivity is a choice. And, and there's a quote, again, there's a trend in my life. I'll hear a, 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 an amazing, awesome, great quote. And then it'll take me three years or four years to figure out, <laughs> figure it out. It has to marinate. But, Lanny Poffo, the genius full of glory and renown with his mortarboard and gown, said on a podcast I was listening to one time, and I forget who told him the story, but, you know, everyone was pissing and moaning in the back, and someone was just happy. They say, man, why are, you, why are you happy all the time? He said, you can be on the happy bus, you can be on a sad bus, and I'll tell you which one's a lot more fun, you know, that type of thing. And it was just a month ago, you know, I was doing this play, I was doing this musical, I did Hairspray the Musical, it turned out great, great cast, great group of people, but I was worn down, and, and when I get worn down, the ADHD kicks up, the OCD kicks up, the depression, the anxiety, all that stuff, it all just gets, it gets exponential, you know, and, uh, and it gets inflated. And I thought, I literally was sitting there and I was just brooding. I mean, you know, I look like Marlon Brando. I was just sitting there, people, what's wrong with this guy? And I just decided, you know what? enough and i stood up this is literally what happened i stood up i walked across the room like george jefferson and i made a joke to somebody and from that and listen everybody has their down moments but from that day on i thought okay i you have to decide that you know mm-hmm. so i think positivity on the internet you know i'm not going to sit here and say we should censor people or all that but there's no reason why the internet can't be a good place too there you go just spread your part of it yeah 
And it works out really well because we actually also have a mental health but podcast on the network. But don't spread your parts on the internet. No, no. <laughs> that can get you in trouble. That can you have a mental health podcast? What's it called? Uh, Fishing Without Bait. I like that. Yep. I like that. I'll come on that one. And when are we doing? They're doing that one Monday when I'm here. <laughs> we can, if you want, we can get it in. I'm sure he'd love to talk with you. It's important. So. That's that's also Sorg's nice way of being like, yeah, don't talk about that crap here. You know, we're, hey, we got a mental health podcast, bro. <laughs> no, no, I think I, I I think that 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 message can get spread in a lot of different ways, and sure. a lot of people on a lot of different levels need to. I'll do hear. it the rest of my life because you, you know I I had this misconception of. You know, I, I would see happy because I was, I was, I'll tell you what, like I said, I'm 31 years old. And for the first 30 years of my life, I was never truly ever happy. I, I met my, I, I got married, you know, a year ago. That was, these, those were all happy things. But inside myself, I would never let myself be happy. I was always sabotaging that mm -hmm. because I always thought, I thought, you know, these happy people out there, it's just effortless. Something's wrong with me. I can't have that. And then I realized now that's work, man. Mm -hmm. Like that's harder than being, it's just like, it's harder to, to be nice to somebody than it is to be mean to them sometimes, you know? So, so happiness is, it's a choice and it's hard work and it's every day. Negativity is the, the easy way out. Well, right. I mean, right. it's easier, you know, there was some guy, some random stranger that was a big jerk to me the other day. I mean, he just started, I don't know what, I don't know what his deal was. He was just being mm -hmm. a big jerk. And instead of being like, Hey, cause I'm way bigger than this guy. I could have been like, get out of here, beat it kid. You know, type of thing. I literally just laughed and was like, how can I help you, man? Because I felt bad. I immediately, cause aside from being mad at first, <laughs> cause my heart started beating. And then I thought, man, how sad for this guy? Cause everyone thinks he's a jerk. I guarantee it. You know? And mm -hmm. I just thought like, Hey man, you know, and then you know what? The whole interaction turned around and it was great. So I, I'm not saying that you have to act like, cause listen, I've been on Twitter. I follow news. I go, I, I follow the Hill. I see that the sky's on fire <laughs> sometimes, but you know, it's not about ignoring negativity in the world, mm -hmm. but it's all about putting it through your filter and being like, okay, that stings. You know what? I'm going to delete this video or I'm going to just make a dumb comment or I'm going to move on. But, you know, you can't let it bring you down like like the other night. Those comments on that video that could have affected me in the past. That would have affected me for a long time. I might not mm -hmm. have said anything to anybody. But instead, I was like, mm, oh, my bad. Delete. <laughs> and moved on. You know, this isn't the place for us. I got it. I got it. <laughs> I forgot you're all jerks. <laughs> You were talking about the young talent and everything a little bit ago, and one of my standard questions is, is uh, you know, what, what's got your attention, whether uh, programs you're watching or wrestlers that got your attention, um, you know, in your, you know, who, who's kind of out there that you think people should be keeping an eye on? Mr. T. <laughs> coming back. <laughs> He's coming back for his mama. <laughs> you know, and, and, and I hate to be this way, but I'll, if I'm being perfectly honest, as far as mainstream wrestling product, I don't watch it. Mm -hmm. And it's not even like, I, I'm not going to watch that type of stuff. It's just that... For me, it's a little too long. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. you know, I'll tune in. My wife and I watched, uh, I think we watched WrestleMania and Royal Rumble and stuff like that. I think it, SummerSlam is either, either coming up or just happened as you watch this. But, um, but, I might check out some big shows like that from time to time. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in NXT, I think everybody can universally agree is pretty great. But uh, I'm a lot more focused on the indies these days. And uh, there are a lot of people out there. First of all, uh, Team Storm is amazing. I love all three of those guys. Uh, Jack Pollock and I sat in the back uh, last week and talked for hours. I mean, just great guy. I don't get to see Jackson and Dupree as much. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's just three guys who get it, and there are three guys who are all different. It's, it's really cool. You know, they're not all banging the same notes, you know, or banging mm -hmm. the same drum. So those are guys uh, – they're they're gonna they're gonna make a bigger impact in wrestling. I really I really truly truly believe that. Other guys that stick out to me who I've really been enjoying lately are even some veterans. I don't know if you ever heard of Nate Matson, but mm -hmm. oh my god, I've mm -hmm. known this guy since since I did Cleveland All Pro, you know, and back in like '06. But uh, man, I love watching him. You know, I, I run into him uh, and we'll, we'll talk for a long time on shows too. So there are just a lot of guys, younger guys. And, you know, Nate, I'm not going to say Nate's an older guy, but he's certainly older than R.C. Dupree. You he's know, he's been around a bit. Right. He's been yeah. around a long time. But you know what? He has a lot to teach. So I think all those people have a lot to offer. I'm glad to see uh, McChesney back. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're talking about a lot of IWC guys, but they're kind of top of mind for me right now. I'm really, really glad to see him back. Chris LaRusso, you know, I did, I did a, a Battle Royal or a Royal Rumble, whatever they're called, some type of, it, it was a bit of a cluster, but uh, <laughs> those things tend to be, but at, uh, at, at one of my uncle's shows recently, and I, it was the first time I'd really done anything with, uh, in the ring with LaRusso, and the second we, like, hooked up, I was like, oh, oh, 
man, chemistry, boom. Mm-hmm. And then uh, last week we we got to do a tag match against each other, and uh, man, it felt great. Larusso, easy. And here's what I like about Larusso. I don't know how deep you guys get into the the nuts and bolts of wrestling and how it works, but Larusso is an idea guy. And the cool thing about that is also uh, it's not it's never ever a selfish idea. Which is fine, too. You know, if you have mm-hmm. ideas for yourself, that's fine, too. But I, one thing I've noticed about LaRusso, he's like, hey, would it be cool if I front flipped off of this and you caught me in a suplex on the apron? It's like, I mean, yeah. <laughs> like, that's cool, man. But but what I mean is it's always good for the match, you know? Yeah, yeah. So LaRusso's a guy I really, really love. I, I, I absolutely adore IWC. I love the roster. I love the fans are amazing because... You know, sometimes because their crowds are getting big, you know, mm-hmm. I'm not just the Meadville one. You know, that was the Hardys and Ryback and everything. And that was in a good show. But that was a huge crowd. But I mean, even the one uh, we're doing tomorrow, I mean, we're talking about a few hundred fans easy. And uh, but I've never get nervous. Like, it's never like, oh, man. OK, OK, OK. All these people. Uh, uh, it, they're, they're gracious fans, if that makes any sense. You know, uh, they get it enough. And you'll hear the comments every once in a while. You know, mm-hmm. there's always the smart guy in the crowd with his arm crossed, you know, who wants to see Chris Colt from, from, from the 80s. <laughs> He's a big Chris Colt fan. He wants to catch you in the bathroom and tell you about Chris Colt. <laughs> you Google it. It's uh, Jim Cordette probably knew who that is. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, so there are still those people, but it's a safe environment, you know, mm-hmm. and, and it's fun. And, and and so that's why I really enjoy IWC and, 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 and you know, the whole Plumber family. They're great, a beautiful family, great people. Uh, and so if you're ever in the Pittsburgh area, which I don't know, how far is Elizabeth from here? How, how long is my drive? Uh, it's probably about a 30 to 45 minute. I got a 30 right down the f- road from here. I got a right down the road drive tomorrow. It's going to be great. But uh, if you're ever in the area, check it out because, you know, the cool thing about these fans up here is they've seen a lot of stuff and they've had a lot of surprises, but mm-hmm. they're not spoiled either mm-hmm. because I've been on the shows where there aren't really any surprises or maybe not even some big major guys, but they still love the show just as much. Mm-hmm. And that's not always the case. Absolutely. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> What's the square root I of this think, studio? I think, we're, I think we're well, well, well into the answer of that one. Um <laughs> So I want to, you know, because I think you've kind of touched on our usual question. Uh, I usually ask, what's the best and worst thing about indie wrestling? But uh, I want to spin it and ask, what's the best and worst thing about theater? Um, You know, rehearsing is more stressful. And Mm -hmm. uh, for me personally, like for one, I mean, it's a lot of waiting. Mm Acting is a lot of waiting. And I guess wrestling Mm -hmm. is too. But uh, depending on what role you have, you know, you're either the lead of the show or you're a secondary character, which is more fun anyway. But so you're either breaking your neck or you're just breaking your butt sitting down. Um, But for me, the rehearsal process has always been more stressful because you know, I've always never wanted to not know my lines or never wanted to hold up the rehearsal process. So like the first night we're rehearsing out of book, you know, without being able to hold the script is always stressful for me. And I'm always trying to perform from day one. I'm trying to make the people behind the table laugh or whatever my goal is, whatever, you know, so, so that's more stressful than when the show is set and we're doing it in front of an audience. That almost feels easy sometimes compared to the rehearsal process because sometimes it's a struggle, you know, and and some of us are very, very, one of the, you know, I've taken a lot, a lot of acting lessons and private lessons and stuff. And one of the things that I, first things I was told was you're too cerebral. You're thinking about it. I mean, you're way, way, way in your head too much about it. So the rehearsal process is where you can do some of that. And that's some of the most stressful stuff you do. Cause the goal really is to get to the point where the show's fluid and you're not even thinking about it, mm-hmm. you know? And, and I'm always one of these actors where I won't almost, I will almost never have the same show, uh, twice in a row. Uh, I'm not saying I'll be changing things up on purpose, but like, I'll try to react to how I'm feeling the audience or, or, uh, what they're kind of reacting to, or even what I'm getting from the other actors and try to make it a little different. Like I've had actors I've worked with say like, you know, it was never boring because every night was a little different. And then that me kind of being in the moment like that allows some of my partners in the scenes to be in the moment also because they're on their toes because they're like, well, that was different. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then they react to what I did. And then it's just kind of a snowball thing from there. Um, and that, that's, that's pro wrestling, dude. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, it's hearing the audience, listening to them, seeing what they're reacting to and giving them that or not giving them that or whatever you decide to do. But, um, someone, uh, I think it was a Jackson stone, the Shogun, uh, last week was asking me about, you know, do you ever get like, how nervous do you get? And, and, and I'll be honest, like, I think if you don't get a little something, uh, 
uh, if you feel like you're just walking to the restroom at your house <laughs> before you go to the ring, then something's wrong. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're going to have be a little elevated. But I don't think I get nervous anymore for these plays and these stuff. I get excited, you know, because I feel like in my brain I'm always prepared. But uh, he was asking, like, what's – what's more nerve wracking doing musicals and plays or doing wrestling. And I said, musicals and plays Well, musicals for sure. Musicals specifically, because in wrestling, something doesn't work. Headlock. Okay. Hold on. <laughs> we got to fix this, you know, or like that didn't work. Let's try this, you know, or whatever the case may be, you know, and I guess the risks are a little higher sometimes in wrestling because sometimes a screw up could be the end of someone's life. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, the thing about theater is, especially musical, if something's off, if the saxophone player drops a saxophone and the music doesn't come in, then what do we do? <laughs> you know, we're like, if you're running off of tracks, you know, music tracks and it doesn't play, it's just like, well, <laughs> you know, in a play, at least you can improvise. But musicals are very stressful because it's very much like everything has a cue and everything's going off of somebody else. And when something drops out, You know, a lot of times it'll fix itself, but it's pretty nerve wracking, you know, Mm -hmm. Uh, wondering if the person's because that's happened to me before where I've been on stage and like there's been the queue line and so and so didn't come through the door. (laughs) And it's like, well, uh, so, you know, let's try to make it like because then the lines start sounding different than they did a second ago. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, Mm -hmm. Uh, so so that's more stressful, I think. Uh, uh, But I will say I've had more in knock on knock on couch. I've had more injuries, serious injuries in theater than I have in pro wrestling. Really? Yeah, because, you know, it's a couple things. Like, for one, aside from maybe top rope stuff, <laughs> I don't really do much in wrestling that I probably shouldn't be doing. Mm-hmm. And I was talking to Nate Madsen about that. And it's like when we talk about R- Randy Savage, when he beat uh, Flair at WrestleMania, was it eight? Mm-hmm. I think it was. He's 40 years old. You know, uh, when Flair was doing his deal in the late 80s with Steamboat, he was about four years old, somewhere around there. So it's like these guys took care of themselves. Not only were they in great shape, and yeah, I guess the style was different, but man, watch back at some of that stuff. I mean, they're doing some pretty wild stuff. Um, you know, you can't watch you can't watch WCW Saturday Night or the Saturday Morning Memphis Show and really see all the spots these guys were doing because they were doing some pretty wily stuff and for about an hour, not mm-hmm. eight minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, but they never did anything that they really probably shouldn't have been doing. And it's not to say they didn't do high risk things, but it was all things they knew they could do or that they could contain. So I've tried to always do that. You know, every once in a while, something might happen where it's like, well, that was weird, but I never, ever wanted to be, I never wanted an injury to take me out of pro wrestling. So I'm always trying to think like, yeah, they happen. We're all hurting. We all have something. Uh, uh, I have a lot of joint, I have a lot of elbow and joint problems and stuff like that. But that just kind of par for the course. But the thing about theater is, you know, uh, it's not really up to me. <laughs> so sometimes, you know, like I've split my toe wide open and, you know, when I was doing Rocky Horror on a set piece and stuff. And one time I was doing a stage fall and a stage fall is a lot different from, a, you know, wrestling's wide open, arms out, you know, mm-hmm. flat as you can. But stage is different. You know, you do a side fall on stage. It's like you roll on your ankle, then your knee, then your hip, then your side, then you're down. But for some reason, my uh, shoulder, my elbow got under me. I was dying at the end of Rocky Horror. Spoiler alert. Uh, Frankfurter dies toward the end. And my elbow got under me and I jammed my shoulder and it was messed up for two years. You know, because at the time I didn't really, I didn't have insurance or anything, you know. So I was just kind of trying to rehab it myself. So I, I couldn't really effectively, I couldn't grip a dumbbell for about nine months. Uh, but you know, so some of my bigger injuries, so theater is dangerous too, but that's also, you know, everyone, I see everyone doing dives and stuff and that's great, but there's a safe way to do it and there's a reckless way to do it. And I, I see some guys doing some of the reckless way and, and I guess that's up to you, but, uh, I've seen guys taken off in a stretcher and never come back to the ring before. And it's not something you ever want to experience. So we can get that wow factor, you know, uh, it, in the art of it, you know, we can build up to certain things. Like I've been on shows where I, so I do the macho man elbow. I love the macho man and I got a pretty mean little top rope elbow, but I've been on shows where other guys have done it on the show too and not gotten much of a reaction out of it. And part of it's because I'm a big guy. That's probably part of it too. But the other part is I always put it in the match that makes sense or that I think would be like, wow, this is the best part to put that or, uh, or, and I always, uh, uh, what do you call telegraph it point to the buckle, look around, we're going to do this. Oh my God, big man's climbing up, you know, whatever it is. So, you know, there's a, there's a buildup to it. And then, then it's almost like, okay, it's been a little bit. Is the guy going to move? Like, well, I hit it, you know, or whatever it is. But I think that that's part of it too. So like, 
you could do the most dangerous dive of all time. You could dive off of what's that place called tomorrow? Sports time. Well, you could dive. Court time, yeah. Yeah. Was it court time? You could court dive. Time, you could dive off a of court time tomorrow and do three backflips, triple gainer, whatever it is. And, and it's happened there. Well, and right, and then <laughs> oh wow, you know. But yeah. you could get a bigger or the same reaction for a less impressive dive if it mm-hmm. just made a lot of sense or was out of nowhere or whatever it is. And I'm not going to get into. The, I'm not going to be the honky tonk man sitting here telling everybody how they're doing it wrong. They fall down. And it's not supposed to hurt, Bret Hart. <laughs> Brett, Brett Hart said he'd rather wrestle. Would you rather wrestle Goldberg to me, Brett? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to sit here and tell them when they're doing it wrong, but I'm just saying there's there's an art form to it. You know, uh, we can't just run out and start giving out the, you know uh, in a play giving out punchlines and doing big finales all the time because then it doesn't mean anything when the play's over. You know, uh, so anyway, I'm not going to awesome. get into that <laughs> any further than I have already. <laughs> well, we've just clicked an hour on this recording. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So six, seven more to go. There you go. There you go. No, listen, listen, I don't want I won't rock the boat too much. You know, I think I think I've given people a lot to, to talk about. Uh, I noticed there are no messages. Uh, right? Is that right? <laughs> Everybody's busy. It's Friday night. Everybody else is doing something else. <laughs> That's all right. Listen, I, I, I'd be doing something else too. That's fine. But you know, people will find this and, 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 uh, you know what they say is you always leave them wanting a little bit more. And even if you don't want a little bit more, I'll probably be back sometime. There we go. <laughs> I think we'll definitely be glad to have you back. Of course, uh, you're, we're, uh, under 24 hours removed from, uh, uh, cage fury yeah. happening with IWC. You've been there on there a, 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 a bit. Um, all those over at IndieWrestling.us. If you guys want to check out, uh, look them up on the search, and you can see all the shows that he's attached to, and and prime, uh, Premier Championship Wrestling as well now. Oh yeah, yeah. So yeah. it's also on there. Oh, that's right. Okay, so. there you go. Yeah, that's that's Joe Dombrowski. He's he's mm-hmm. a wonderful man, and 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 actually, I'll see him tomorrow. And I'll, Joe, I'm going to give you a big fat wet kiss tomorrow. There so you we, go. we talk in code. That's code for something else. Sure. But uh, he's a very knowledgeable knowledgeable guy. I mean, actually, you know, we we've exchanged messages back and forth since my match last week of just learning stuff. You know, because mm-hmm. you ne- that, that's another thing that I uh, you know you're never ever ever done learning. And if you are, if you think you're done learning, then just quit. Because what's what's the point? then you know you're not gonna you're not gonna get any better so uh, uh you know nate madsen's been wrestling 20 years he probably learned something last saturday you know so keep open to it all the time you you don't know everything i don't care how many dives you think you can do or how good your headlock is you're going to be able to learn something else absolutely where can people find you online oh where can't they okay cupid <laughs> grinder tender uh blender <laughs> uh Oh, you know what? Old wrestling is where you can find me. Uh, that's coming up. It's in a, it's in a week. Uh, Marion Fontaine mm-hmm. uh, puts on a wonderful show in Ohio, uh, and it's one of a kind. And if I you gotta get if, the one, you you I will love it. You will love it. Two things. Here's why it's a couple. Of, I mean, there's a lot of reasons it's great, but two that come to mind is one, it's it's unique. It's 19, set in the 1920s. I play a 1920s gangster. It's fun. Last time, I think I wrestled a moonshine jug for a while. <laughs> I got a moonshine jug and a headlock, and it worked me up and pulled my hair into the ropes and this whole deal. I don't even remember, but but it's it's a ton of fun, and it, it's 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 fun for everybody. The whole family can go, but also you're it's not going to be hokey in a bad way and boring. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, also, I mean, it's just a lot of nice guys, and it's, you're in and out in two hours. <laughs> it's great. It's a great show. Um, but it's their biggest show, the Extravaganza. I think it's coming up in. Uh, let's see, where is that? Where is that in Ohio? Norwalk, Norwalk, Ohio. Yeah, at the fairgrounds out there. That's where we filmed and marking out. We filmed some of their stuff. But uh, you can definitely find me at Old Wrestling. But um, I think I'm at the Magnum CK because some schmuck out there has Magnum CK. Like that's the most random, like idiotic name you could possibly have. Like, okay, it's wrestling. I get it. It's a play on. I was trying to come up with some, as a joke, I mentioned Magnum CK one time and it kind of stuck because it sounds super eighties. But as a, as a civilian, (laughs) as a guy from like, I think he's from like central India or something. And he's Magnum CK. And I'm like, what? Like, I want to talk to you out of this. Like, let's let's have a conversation. Probably means something else though. Right. I guess, but I don't know. So I'm at the Magnum CK, you know, ignorance is bliss, but bliss is boring. Is that on his, that's that's his profile. Yeah. No tweets. 
Yeah, right. See, that's right. That's the that's the worst. Thing. This guy, like, I I crave Twitter. I'm on Twitter all the time. I, I you know, I, I crave it like like zombies crave brains. I'm on this Twitter, and uh, this guy's got zero tweets. He doesn't even know what he's Man. sitting on a gold mine. Email but- Twitter, be like, hey, here's me. Here's some video of me. I'm obviously <laughs> yeah. important. Verify me and get this guy yeah. out of here with no tweets. Yeah, and this guy doesn't yeah. even love you as much as I do. There Twitter. you go. But yeah, the Instagram, Twitter, the whole thing. I mean, you know, I think these days people can kind of Google stuff but uh you know i I have a youtube i don't because i started a new youtube like for myself and yeah they they change youtube you have to have a hundred subscribers to get like a link like a youtube.com slash magnum the magnum ck i suppose so uh i need some subscribers on there and then we'll get that going so i'm doing some of that stuff i'm doing a lot of 80s videos and stuff like that you know i got the video filter on my phone and everything and uh and uh, so it's a, it's a fun deal. So just, just I don't know, search it. You know, we will share it. We'll figure Cause, it out. Just because it, it kind of reminds me, and I completely just watched the new ones today. Uh, do you watch South Paul Wrestling? Do you know the funny thing is I've never seen it, but um, I, I, I ha- I've had a lot of people mention it to me, and I've seen some trailers for things. Mm-hmm. And uh, is it you? Are you a fan? Is that the? the is, oh, absolutely. You, yeah. So I know it's like a bunch of current wrestlers, like just playing characters, being sit like kind of Memphis type style yep. stuff. Yeah. See, I see. Well, the wrestling I watch, I'm I'm halfway through 1986 Memphis Saturday morning wrestling <laughs> on YouTube, so that's that's kind of my thing. So I, I'm sure I'll check it out at some point. But uh, but uh, you know, it, oh, I almost made a dirty joke there. I won't make it. But it's not. It's not to me. It's not the real thing. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's like it's like uh, I, if I can watch Memphis, I'll watch that. But I, but I do like. I think John Cena is one of the funniest guys. Uh, just in wrestling in general. So I think he's a big part of that. So I'd like to see that. It's good. You can watch uh, both seasons of it in under an hour. It's a piece of cake. Yeah, you know what? Maybe maybe some it. night maybe some night I'll run out of Lance Russell to watch. Which, by the <laughs> way, can we just say best ever, Lance Russell. I don't know if you... Do you watch much much Memphis? No, I'm not not in the loop on oh, that. Just whatever uh, random stuff they throw on the network. Do you ever see... Did you ever see like the Andy Kaufman Memphis stuff? Like, yeah, was, he I've commentated seen... on Ann Lawler now on the outside <laughs> with Kaufman rude out of the showers. Now he's amazing. He's the best. Uh, check out Memphis. If you go to Memphis, nobody cares about this, but you go to YouTube.com. You, you know, I, I have a feeling if they're this long in the show and they're still with us, I think they're going to care about Chris LaRusso. I know sure. you're still watching. Chris LaRusso, our, our <laughs> super kick hipster, Chris LaRusso. Yeah, man. But, uh, you know, go to YouTube, type in Memphis Wrestling 1986 as a playlist and just watch it for a while. Because, I mean, if nothing else, some of it's great wrestling. A lot of it's not. <laughs> but that's after fun. And that's the thing you remember is wrestling's never changed. There's mm-hmm. been good wrestling and bad wrestling on every show ever. Watch any, any promotion of all time. Uh, has good wrestling and bad wrestling at the same time. And, and, and indie wrestling too, man. Sometimes I'll go to a promotion and be like, I'm going to go to that promotion. And it's because it's a lot of fun and maybe not for the right reasons. Yeah. You know? Oh, no, yeah. I've done the same yeah. thing. I've yeah. actually, that's how I met Cole Cabana the first time because he was on a show <laughs> and I was like, oh, man, I like to meet Cole Cabana. Oh, it's that show. Oh, God, that's terrible. Let's go. Uh, <laughs> but you ever heard of Jeff Farmer? I've heard the name. Jeff Farmer, the yip. The, the promo, the famous promo. Okay. Mike and I know the guy who found those tapes and put them all on YouTube. We met him through a podcast we used to do. He's an actual like friend of ours. His name's Honeydew Wilkins on YouTube. <laughs> Find him. He's got all the IPWs, what that's called. He's got full episodes now. It's incredible. Speaking of bad <laughs> wrestling, like you will be in rapture. So, so it's it's South Park Wrestling, but we really found these tapes and put right. them out there on YouTube. Yeah. So exactly. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it's it's it's. Un- it's like it's like the holy grail of oh, terrible, geez. terrible wrestling. So yeah, it's South Paul wrestling, but it's sad and real. <laughs> <laughs> that you watch this terrible wrestling and you're like, that's someone's dream. <laughs> <laughs> You That's great. Jumping Jeff Farmer. Nine CK, thank you so much for joining us here in the studio, right here in Pittsburgh. Yeah, and all you Sorgan players out there, or sort what I call <laughs> Sorgan donors out there, you keep tuning in and tune into that mental health podcast because you probably need it more than you think you do. But find me at a show. I will gladly talk to you. Uh, I, I'm a very open, personable guy for the most part, so uh, I'm doing this for fun. I don't know how many years I'll be doing this. I'll be doing it till the wheels fall off, I suppose, uh, or till it gets sad. And, and, and probably further. And probably <laughs> I'm gonna even do it. Further. I'm gonna do it one year after it's sad. Ha 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 ha
and then you have a farewell tour, right? <laughs> and then it's my last match. It's my last match. <laughs> but yeah, for real. I mean, let's, let's connect. Let's talk. You know, I have a lot of fans who I've met, and I won't name any of them, but I've met them through shows or I've met them online, and we've just literally were friends, like, emotionally. Like, they'll be like, oh, my gosh. Like, I'm so depressed. I have this going on, and I'll just talk to them, you know, and stuff mm-hmm. like that. I'm like the Richard Simmons of the indie wrestling. <laughs> That's mostly because of my shorts. <laughs> <laughs> and the fanny pack. Yeah, absolutely. And let's go, Grandma. <laughs> yeah, but listen, thank you guys very, very much, and I'll be back. I'll see you guys on Monday. Yeah, exactly. All right, thanks a lot. And, of course, check out everything at uh, uh, IndieWrestling.us, of course, to support a lot of these guys that we've had on the show, and uh, subscribe to this show wherever you want to find Indie Mayhem Show and everything at Wrestling Mayhem Show. We talk about Indies. We talk about main shows. We talk about Lucha Underground. We talk about whatever comes to our mind, especially on the main wrestling mayhem show that is live every Tuesday at uh, 10 PM Eastern time on our Facebook page and live at wrestling mayhem show.com. And keep an eye on the Facebook page for when these happen. We're on a random Friday night here in Beachview, Uh, And uh, we got Jack Paula coming up here live as well. And of course the releases for the finalized versions of these every Thursday on those streams. Uh, So until next time support indie wrestling and apparently old Crappy YouTube wrestling too while you're at it. We'll see you next time. This show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network. Find out more at sorgatronmedia.com.